If you'll travel back in time with me, way back in time, to, to the beginning, and imagine with me what it would be like to be Adam and Eve in the garden, where God has created man and woman and placed them into his garden and told them to cultivate the garden, to tend the garden. We actually get our word culture from that. They were to create a culture in which God was at the center. And they had a direct access to the Father as he walked and talked with them. And they had a direct relationship to the Father as they interacted with him in this relationship that he made. It was beautiful. It was as, as God had desired it to be for the man and the woman in the garden with direct access to him and a direct relationship. But you and I know the story, don't we? As Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. We know the rest of the story. Man and woman chose to be independent of God, chose to be their own gods, and in so doing, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin entered into the equation. And we know, Paul says, and death came by sin, and death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So we have now this thing that has come in between the man and the woman and God. We call it sin. It has broken the relationship between the man and the woman and God, and now there's no longer a direct access to God, for God removes them from his garden, sends them out, puts an angel there to block the entrance back into the garden, sends man out into the world. So the direct access to God, limited access, yes, but direct access, no, and a direct relationship, no. Sin is still a problem for the man and the woman, and that has been our problem in humanity ever since. So God established what we understand as this law and the priesthood that was wrapped around the law so that he could allow men and women a limited access to him. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look at the picture of this Jewish temple right here. This is the second temple. Herod expanded it. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. This is the temple proper. This is this area. This right here is this area right here of the temple proper. And we see in Exodus 25 that God says, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. That mercy seat above the ark of the covenant was in this place called the most holy place right here. This design, this temple, the tabernacle before it, which was the model for the temple, this temple, if you look at it, just looking at this right here tells us that we do not have access to God. Let me, say, let me show you what I mean. If you're a Gentile and you wanted to come to worship the God of the Jews and you came to this big temple area right here, you'll see there's a little wall that runs right here, around here. This outer area is called the Court of the Gentiles. So if you're a Gentile and you wanted to have access to God, now remember where is God? God is right here. I've placed my name above the mercy seat. God is right inside right there. God is not right here. God is right there. And you're a Gentile and you want to come to, to be with God? Guess what? You can't go any further than that wall right there. As a matter of fact, on the entrances right there, there are signs that posted that says, Gentiles, if you pass beyond this point, fear death. That's my paraphrase. You can't go inside there. Okay, we'll say you're an Israeli. You're an Israeli woman. If you look up in this top part up here, we have right here called the court of the women. This is a place that the Israeli women can go, but the Israeli women could not go into the most holy place. There was no access to God for them. Well, what if you're a Jewish male? Well, the Jewish male couldn't go anywhere beyond basically the court of the females into the area that was simply only for the priests, for this is the court of the priests right here. And no Jewish male had direct access to God either because God is here and you're outside. There is no direct access to God, and there is no direct relationship to God. If you're the high priest, you get one time a year, you get to go into the most holy place, and first you offer a sacrifice for yourself for your own sins, and then you offer another sacrifice for the sins of the nation, and you get to go in there, but only one time a year. You don't have direct access to God every day. You can't go in there every day. If you went in there other than the Day of Atonement, not good. In fact, tradition tells us they used to tie a rope around the high priest's leg that in case he did something stupid inside the most holy place, who's going to go in and get him? You got to pull him out somehow. At least that's what tradition says. I don't know if that's really true. That's what tradition says. 
But this whole setup that God has instituted as the Levitical system of sacrifices tells us one thing. We do not have direct access to God nor direct relationship to him. We are on the outside looking in. As a worshiper, direct access to God. Remember, God is here. You only, as a Gentile, can go here. If you're only a woman, you can go here. Not much further than the Israeli men. The priest can only go here, and the high priest only once a year. Direct access to God was not possible under the Levitical priesthood. Limited access through the high priest and only once a year. Your desire was just if you wanted to come and have direct access to God in a direct relationship. Your desire was a just desire. But there were no means for you to achieve your desire as a worshiper. You had no direct access to God. When we looked at the first part of chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews, we saw in verses 1 through 10 this idea of that Christ is has a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And the idea of the first section we read, verses 1 through 10, was the idea of Christ's eternal priesthood. That since he's eternal, he can be make effective everything that he has promised to us for all time because he never dies. He doesn't pass on to a successor his role as high priest. But now the writer wants to take a step further for us. Here he's going to show us that Melchizedek was a type of the true high priest, Jesus Christ, who would come and make direct access and relationship with the Father possible. So there's this comparison going on in the system set up under the Levitical priesthood, not allowing you and I as a worshiper to have direct access to God. And now we have this new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, an eternal priest that allows you and me direct access to God and a direct relationship to him. What would life be like if we have no one there to help us in our time of need. I'm a pretty poor help. I'm limited. What if there was no one we could call to when we needed help? There was no one outside of ourselves that would intercede for us and stand for us when we needed strength to care for us, to guide us. What would life be like if that's the state we found ourselves in? So in verses 1 through 10, the writer described Melchizedek as a type of Christ, a shadow of what was to come. Now he's going to, in the rest of the chapter 7, he's going to show us that the substance of the shadow, that which casts the shadow, the substance of the shadow, Jesus Christ, and he's going to talk about all these things about how Melchizedek a type, Christ the substance of that type. Christ is the fulfillment of this type of Melchizedek that we saw in verses 1 through 10. He is the substance of the reality. When Paul was talking to the Colossians, he was talking about things like new moons and festivals and feasts, and then he said this statement here. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So Melchizedek was simply a shadow, simply a type pointing to a substance, pointing to a reality. And that's what the writer wants to talk to us today about. This reality of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done for us. So the writer unfolds the substance of the type and majestically exalts the person of Jesus Christ and his work of redemption. Look at verses 11 through 19 of chapter 7. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Good question. Reasonable question. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, all, like all Levitical priests, but the, by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. 
So verses 1 through 10 speaks about the superiority of Melchizedek to the Levitical priests. Now the writer moves to show the superiority of Jesus, the great high priest who was like Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4, which you saw twice here in the text that we read, is obviously a famous passage for the writer of Hebrews. He goes back to it often and reminds us that Jesus' priesthood was based on a promise and an oath, not on bodily descent like the Levitical priests. You'll notice right after this word is perfection in verse number 11. Now, my translation is the word perfection. Perfection. It has the idea of an actualization of the promise, a fulfillment, an accomplishment, completion of the end of a process, the end goal. So in other words, the Levitical priesthood could never reach the end goal of giving us direct access to God and a direct relationship to God. It wasn't designed for that. It was designed for something else. So it could never reach that which its end goal was and that God desired a relationship with humanity through the work of his son on the cross. So the old system could never bring this to us. It couldn't give it to us. It could never perfect that which we desired, that is direct access to God and direct relationship to him. The old Levitical system could not enable the worshiper an approach to God because its sacrifices were not able to cleanse from sin, and that has been our problem. Never The problem of sin being in the way of our relationship with God, that was always a problem. For every year in the Levitical system, one time the high priest has to offer sacrifices for the nation, and then they have to do it again and again and again, and it's a constant reminder that sin is a problem. It's never dealt with. So the old system could never allow us to approach to God because it never took care of sin. Look at Hebrews. Again, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect, complete, help the people reach their goal, those who draw near. It was unable to do that. It was only a shadow of the substance that was going to come. In verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That was the problem. The Levitical system could never remove sins. It only covered them for a period of time to be remembered again at the next day of atonement. Now, we have to say there is nothing wrong with the Levitical system. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not wrong. But under the divine arrangement, it was designated as a shadow anticipating the substance. It was designated as a shadow. It was intended to be in a shadow so that when the substance came, we could look back and say, oh, look, God, you've painted this picture all along. Now here's the substance of this type that you were showing us. The law certainly has a permanent place in God's overall plan as an essential part of the development of his purposes for salvation. Again, the law is not bad. We're the problem. The law is not the problem. The Levitical priesthood was a divine, you could say, a divine failure. It was intended to be a shadow, not a reality. Because God never intended to bring about salvation. It couldn't. It couldn't remove sin. That's the problem of the system. It was designed to be temporary. And that which is permanent has come. We don't want to go back to the temporary anymore. And that was the danger of the people in the first century, these Hebrews. They're they're questioning, do we trust Jesus still? Is he sufficient Can he meet my needs? Can I survive and thrive in this world now when everything I knew has actually cast me off? My old Hebrew background. I'm no longer worshiping in the synagogue anymore. I'm not going to the temple. I've trusted in Jesus the Messiah for salvation. Now all of my Hebrew friends have have thrown me away. My family doesn't want anything to do. Is he sufficient to take care of all of my needs? But the writer says that those priests were just a shadow of that which is to come. The idea of another priest needed to arise, and we didn't need another of the same kind, for they're not helpful for us. They lived, they died, they passed it on to somebody else. We needed someone who was eternal. We needed someone who would be there all the time for us, who would never leave us or forsake us, who would intercede us for us constantly. We needed someone like that, and the Levitical priest couldn't do it for us. We needed another one of a different kind, not the same kind, a different kind. The Old old Covenant priesthood could not bring about final atonement and the spiritual reality of access to God. It wasn't possible under that system. Jesus is 
priesthood, not depending on physical descent, but upon a promise and an oath. The quality like Melchizedek, described in Genesis 14, and again, Psalm 110, verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we have here a promise and an oath. God has sworn by a promise. So not bodily descent, but by a call of God, a promise and an oath, Christ is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ is actually what Melchizedek was symbolically, an eternal priest who exercises his high priestly rights in a non-legal, universal, that is to all nations, ministry. Ben Ho commented, the difference reveals that in the eyes of the author, Melchizedek was only a prefiguration of the eternal priest, a sketch which represented him in a suggestive but imperfect fashion. Another expression that immediately precedes this clearly demonstrates this point of view. Melchizedek has been made like to the Son of God. He was not the Son of God, but the text of Genesis has described him in such a way that his figure suggests the person of the Son of God. We needed a different kind of high priest. The first ones were insufficient for us to have direct access to God or a direct relationship to Him. Christ's priesthood, as promised to us in verses 1 through 10, is eternal. It never ceases. So the effects of His ministry are ongoing for all times. He's there by an indestructible life. And some may say, whoa, I thought He died on a cross. Yes, He did die on a cross. But Christ's life was not destroyed by the death suffered on the cross. He rose from the dead. He has an indestructible life. It could not be destroyed. Romans 6 says, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The superior quality of the new priest, like Melchizedek, assures a better hope for us. The the old is set aside. The new brings with us this better hope of now you and I can go directly to God. We can be directly in relationship to Him. Access to God is available. The law was weak because it could not save or bring about an inward change in a person. It simply described our state and showed us what we were deplorable sinners in in the face of a holy God who's offended his holiness, who is separated from him because of our sin. That's the, the law simply, that's what his purpose was, to show us that we needed a savior. Romans 3 says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's what the law was there. The law is not a problem. We're the problem. That's why verse eight of uh, verse three of Romans eight, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, that's my flesh, could not do. I couldn't be holy. My flesh is too weak. I couldn't be righteous. My flesh is too weak. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So what the law could not do because of our human weakness, God has now done it for us. So that the law was imperfect in that sense. It couldn't reach the goal of what you and I wanted, and that is direct access to God and a direct relationship to Him. The uselessness comes from the fact that the law regulated the approach to God, told us exactly how we were to approach Him, and it was always through another person. And it was only able to cleanse us externally the law. Now for them in the first century, for those Hebrew Christians to give up such a hope, this better hope by Jesus Christ, the better hope that he brings for any temporal benefits would be an act revealing a disgraceful lack of wisdom on their part. Why would you abandon hope when it has been given to you? Why would you go back to that which is inferior, which is of less quality, which is imperfect, It wasn't designed to be perfect. It was designed to be a shadow. So when the perfect one came, the reality, the substance of that shadow, we would all go, oh, that's what you're talking about, God. That's what you were saying. We get it now. This idea now that we can draw near to God. It's a a present tense, which means we can continually draw near to God. We can always draw near to God. We can always have access to God. We can always be in relationship to God through his son and his work. Again, again look, at, look at the tabernacle. Everything designed about the... Here, here's where God is, above the mercy seat, in the most holy place right there. 
Everything about this tabernacle screams one thing to the worshiper. You can't come in. Look, there's a fence, a curtain. Only the priest can go in there. You and I as a worshiper could not go in there. And then the priest ministered in here and in here, and then the high priest only once in. This whole thing screams, you can't come in. You don't have access to God. And if you do, it's limited, and it's only one time a year on the Day of Atonement by the high priest. Other than that, you're on the outside. Everything about the structure of the tabernacle, its priesthood and regulations, prohibited people from coming anywhere near the holy place or the holies of holies where the presence of God dwelled. That screams to us, no access. Now some of you may say, wait a second. Isn't this really a blessing that we even have a limited access to God as sinful human beings? Yes. Don't get me wrong. Yes. But that's the old system. The new system that Christ instigated is the fact that you and I can come directly to God and have a direct relationship with Him. Through Christ's work of the cross, His resurrection and ascension, He makes possible an access to God and relationship to Him that was not possible under the old covenant. He has given us a better covenant. Acts 13 says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is free from everything from which you could not be freed from by the law of Moses. Christ has given to us a direct access to God and a direct relationship to him. And you say, well, how does that work? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the rhetorical questions. I'll answer them myself, so you don't have to answer them, okay? So where is Christ located? Christ has died, he was buried, he rose again the third day, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. He is now in the very presence of the Father, isn't he? He's in the presence of the Father. You and I, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, we are told that we died with him, we were buried with him, we rose with him, we ascended with him, and we are seated, according to Paul in the Ephesians, we are seated with him already in heavenly places. So where are you and I as a believer? We are in Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus Christ? In the presence of the Father. You have direct access to God 24-7 in Jesus Christ. You are in Him, and He in the presence of the Father. When the world throws you away, you can come to God. When the world ridicules you, you can come to God. When the world persecutes you, you can come to God. When the world marginalizes you, you can come to God. And when the world hates you, you have direct access to the Father. You can come into his presence at any time. Stuart Sachs wrote, While I was serving in Paraguay, a Maka Indian named Raphael came to sit on my porch. I was eating and went out to see what he wanted. He responded, Ham Hanek Met. Again, I asked what I could do for him, but the answer was the same. I understood what he was saying, but not its significance. So ham hanak met simply means, I don't want anything. I've just come to be near. That's what the ham hanak met. I don't need anything. I've just come to be near. I later shared the incident with a local veteran missionary. He explained that it was Raphael's way of honoring me. He really didn't want anything. He just wanted to sit on my porch He found satisfaction and pleasure just being near me. The Lord says, What brings you here today, my child? Ham Hanak Med. I really don't need anything. I just want to be with you. I just want to be near you. I don't need anything. I just want to be in your presence. And Christ has guaranteed God's presence to us and a direct relationship with him. So believers in the new covenant have secured assurance have a secured assurance of a quality of access and a relationship with God that was not possible now under the Levitical system. Look at verses 20 through 28. We'll continue on. And it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. In other words, simply by bodily descent coming from Aaron, the high priest or, or Levi the priest. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Again, Psalm 110.4. This makes Jesus a guarantor of a better covenant. So we have a better hope in the first section and a better covenant now in this section. 
The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. He has an eternal priesthood. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He doesn't need a successor to take his place. He always lives to make intercession for us. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Again, the offerer and the one who offered. The law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The first benefit of this new priesthood and high priest is that the new covenant has a guarantee who assures its effectiveness, both for the present and the future. When he promised and said, this, this, and this will happen if you put your faith and trust in me, that's my promise to you. He is a guarantor, guarantor that that promise will come to pass. He promises it. And he's, a, he, he's ever living to be effective to make sure he keeps his promises. The contrast of the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Jesus is not a comparison of a lesser and greater of the same kind, but one of one kind and another that's far better of a different kind. Now this is the first mention of the word covenant in the book of Hebrews. And it's notice that there's an adjective in front of it. It's a better covenant. So the first time covenant is, is listed, there's a better covenant than the old covenant. The new covenant is effective. It reaches its goal because approach to God is guaranteed by Jesus in his office as high priest. Now we have a guaranteed direct access to God and a direct relationship to him through Jesus Christ. He'll never be passed on to another person. He'll never, succeed, he'll never be succeeded to another. He ever lives. He's a mediator. Now the mediator is simply a, a person that steps between two parties that need to be reconciled. That's what a mediator does. But a guarantor is something far different than that. He stakes his person and his very life on the word that he has says. He guarantees that it'll come to pass. So because of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, he provides the security that the new covenant will never be annulled. It'll never be annulled. It will always be effective because he always lives to make intercession for us. Now the second benefit of the eternal priesthood of Christ is that he is able to mediate an eternal and ultimate salvation. Again, Levitical system covered sin, never took it away. Now we have an ultimate salvation. We have now the problem of sin being dealt with in Jesus Christ. And I hope that you've trusted Christ as your Savior today. I hope the question of sin in your life has been dealt with, that you know Christ as your Savior. If not, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to put your life in Jesus' hand. Trust Him for salvation. But if you have, this is the ultimate and eternal salvation that He mediates. The idea of the temporariness of the many priests and the permanence of the one, the comparison is there. There are many because they came and died. There's one because he ever lives. The sacrificial work of Jesus never needs to be repeated, unlike the Levitical priestly sacrifices. They had to be offered all the time. His only once, once for all. The writer's goal has been to strengthen the Christian community that lacked certainty. Is he really the answer? Should I go back to the old system? I feel comfortable there. All my friends are there. My family is there. Or do I trust this Jesus? Is there a certainty in the salvation that I can hold on to that gives me hope? And the writer of Hebrews says, absolutely. Not only that, you have direct access to God and a direct relationship to him. So the direct result of his intercessory work is the sustaining of the people of God and the security of all that is necessary to the future salvation mentioned by the writer already. He's a guarantee of it. It will come to pass. This is exactly the kind of high priest the hearers needed who was able to meet all of their needs. Is he sufficient is the question. And I think that's the question you and I ask today, isn't it? In the midst of all the turmoils of life, is Jesus sufficient? Is he enough? Or do I need something else? Do we need to go back to the old system that I lived under prior to claiming faith in Christ? Is he sufficient? The writer says he's absolutely sufficient for you. He promises to meet all of your needs. 
In fact, the, Paul told, told the Philippians, you know this one, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Is he sufficient for you today? Yes, is what the writer says. He is spiritually and morally superior. He's different from all others and has accomplished his high priestly ministry by his direct, unhindered access to God. The word make intercession for indicates every act by which the Son, in dependence on the Father, and in the Father's name, and with the perfect concurrence of the Father, takes his own with him into the Father's presence in order that whatever he himself enjoys in the communications of his Father's love might become theirs also. Do you remember what Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 over and over again? The theme of that is that we, he and the Father, and all who believe that we may be one that we may know him that we can come to him we can be in relationship to him Jesus' offering of himself as the supreme sacrifice has put an end to the whole system of the Levitical sacrifices don't go back to it don't go back to the way that it used to be So the summary basically is this, the contrast, the law, the oath, men as humans and the divine son, sinful, having been made perfect, all these contrasts going on in the text right here. The hearers needed to understand that this covenant, inaugurated by God, is utterly reliable and able to bring them benefits of surpassing value for which they are willing to continue. That they would continue to endure this this loss of respect and comfort in their society for the everlasting riches of the glory of Christ Jesus. God's own commitment of his name and honor to this priesthood assures success to those who approach him through Jesus Christ. You have direct access. See, the problem with us today is we've heard this for 2,000 years, the teaching of the New Testament. We understand all believers have direct access to God. But you have to understand, these were Hebrews of the first century. They understood the Levitical system very well. And they knew in that system, there was no direct access to God. And there was no direct relationship. Limited access, limited relationship because of the problem of sin. Now, now they can come to God anytime. And we have heard that over and over again so many times. You know what I think it is? I think actually we ignore it. You're in, you're, in, you're in need. Oh, I know I can go to God, but I don't. I got a problem, but I know I should run to God and look to the Word for help, but I don't. I think it has been past aid us. It's become just so commonplace to think, oh, I have direct access to God and I have a direct relationship to Him in Christ. We've heard it for 2,000 years. But the problem is, these first century hearers did not grasp that concept. And I think we take it for granted. I think we take it for granted. We never need to fear a time in the future when there is no mediator at work to sustain the believer's relationship with God, nor exchange of the faithful and effective mediator for an unreliable one. He continues forever. He is well suited, Jesus is, to meet the need of the Christian community for an effective mediator. Again, he has given us direct access to God and a direct relationship to him. When you need strength, you can come to God. When you need wisdom, you can come to God. When you need encouragement, you can come to God. When you need assurance, you can come to God. And when you need hope, you can come to God because he has provided a direct access to the Father and a relationship with him that can never be established under the old covenant for it is far superior. Let us not neglect this great salvation that has been given to us. Let's pray. Father, we have heard this over and over again. We understand it because the writers of the, of the New Testament explain this to us and we get it. But we had failed to remember how precious this direct access is to you. This direct relationship that we have now with, uh, with you in Christ. We have forgotten how precious it is. We have forgotten that we actually stand in your very presence in Christ continually. We are on his heart. Just like the high priest carried the nation of Israel on his breastplate, we are on Jesus' heart. He is in your presence, and we are in him. We are in your presence too. Thank you, Father, 
that the question of sin and the issue of sin has been dealt with so that we may have direct access to you and a direct relationship with you. So thank you, Father, for this great eternal work of the great high priest, Jesus Christ, whose ministry is always effective and all of his promises will come to pass. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.